everyone. Um, welcome to the final event on the final day of Kingston Writers Fest. My name is Ara McCauley and I am the artistic director of the festival and I'm very pleased to present On Property. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which the festival customarily takes place and where I am situated tonight is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. We gratefully acknowledge these Indigenous nations for their ongoing guardianship of their land. We agree to peaceably share in responsibility for stewardship of this land, its waters, and all of its biodiversity. All those who come to live and work here are responsible for honoring these relationships in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. I would like to thank the Canada Council, Canadian Heritage, Ontario Arts Council, the City of Kingston and Kingston Arts Council for their ongoing support of the festival. We are grateful to all the organizations and individuals who support us. And I'd particularly like for this event to thank Judith Brown, author patron for Ronaldo Walcott. I welcome you um, to type questions into the Q&A box you find at the bottom of the screen. This event is an hour long, um, but we will dedicate some time at the end for any questions that you might have. Um, as a thank you for your continuing support of Kingston Writers Fest and for joining us for the virtual edition of the festival, we will randomly select a pre-registered participant of this event um, following our Q&A to win a copy of On Property. Um, so now I am delighted to introduce this event's presenter, Dr. Ronaldo Walcott. Ronaldo Walcott is an associate professor at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education and the director of Women and Gender Studies Institute. He's also a member of the graduate program in cinema studies of faculty of arts and scientists at the, of, and science, sorry, at the University of Toronto. His teaching and research is in the area of Black diaspora cultural studies and post-colonial studies with an emphasis on questions of sexuality, gender, nation, citizenship, and multiculturalism. Ronaldo is the author of several titles, including The Long Emancipation, Moving Towards Freedom, which was just released this year, Black Like Who, Writing Black Canada, Queer Returns, Essays on multi Multiculturalism, Diaspora and Black Studies, and Editor of Rude, contemporary Black Canadian cultural criticism, amongst many others. Author David Cheriandi calls him one of the most renowned and dynamic articulators of the Black radical tradition. His writings are essential for anyone seeking deeper engagement with the social and political movements urgently afoot today. Please welcome Ronaldo. Thank you. Ara for um, the lovely introduction and thank you to um, the Kingston Writers Festival for inviting me to participate. Um, I'm pleased to be here. Um, I think what I want to do tonight is read two or three short excerpts from the book. Um, but before I do that, I want to say something about the context of the book, how it came to be. Um, as you all know, um, late spring of 2020 was a particularly difficult and simultaneously amazingly empowering time in North America. Not only was North America part of a global pandemic, but that is, um, the moment when um, many people witnessed as they were shut away in their homes during the pandemic, the uh, murder, the lynching of George Floyd in Minnesota, Minneapolis. And that's the moment when after, in the aftermath of that, when hundreds of thousands of people across North America and elsewhere around the world, braved COVID and took to the streets to seek justice. Um, it was a remarkable moment in many ways. Um, we saw um, the largest protest that movement we've ever seen in North America. And so this book is written 
in the urgency of that moment, even though the ideas in this book have a much longer history, um, both in relationship to um, the murder of George Floyd and the tragedy that ensues from that, but also in terms of my own intellectual development as well. Um, the other thing that I wanna say about the book is that it comes out of um, a conversation that um, emerged uh, when I was doing an interview about the events surrounding George Floyd's murder, very public murder um, on CBC radio. And towards the end of the interview, I mentioned that um, if we are to actually deal with the issues that um, Mr. Floyd's murder suggested that we needed to deal with, that we would have to address the question of property and that in fact, we would have to be, we would have to abolish property. Of course, we all know that Judge Floyd was in part murdered because of the accusation that he tried to pass a fake $20 bill. Um, Dan Wells, the publisher and editor of um, Biblio Asis, who published this book, um, heard me in that interview and reached out to me and said, hey, I'm doing this series um, that looks at issues that pertain to the present, the, the urgency of the moment. Um, can we talk and maybe are you willing to expand on the idea about abolishing property? So that in a nutshell is how this book came to be. Um, what I'm gonna do now is read you three, two or three short excerpts from the book. And then I'll come back to some of the ideas of the book and then we can open it up for questions and conversation and so on. So <clears throat> the first part of the book that I want to read from sets a little bit of the historical scene of what I'm thinking about the kinds of questions, histories that I'm drawing on in this book. So here goes. The long-term history of abolition is founded in the historic fight to abolish the Atlantic trade in African flesh and to end plantation slavery across the Americas. The foundation on which present day abolition is built is the historic struggle to bring black people out of slavery and into more positive and equal relationships with property and white people while ensuring that freedom of movement. David Brion Davis in Inhuman Bondage, The Rise and the Fall of Slavery in the New World makes the case, he writes, that the fall of New World slavery could not have occurred if there had been no abolitionist movements, end quote. Indeed, one must amend Davis to acknowledge the roles played by the enslaved as well as the formerly enslaved, freed black people and runaways in the, abolition movement, in the abolitionist movements of that time and in the eventual end of black enslavement in the Americas. Key to Davis's insights into the abolitionist movement is his acknowledgement that, quote, it shall help inspire some confidence in other movements for social change, for not being condemned to fully accept the world into which we are born, end quote. Davis shows that all social movements born after the abolition of slavery in the Americas borrowed tactics from the latter and that the abolitionist movement offered a template for organizing large scale protests, letter writing campaigns, public demonstrations, testimonials, etc. In our current moment, abolitionist politics attempts as the celebrated abolitionist activist and community organizer, Marion Kaba has argued to help us conceive of a world without the police. However, I am also going to suggest that contemporary abolitionist movements represent unfinished business from the first abolition movements and are part of a renewed effort for transformed global polity. 
The idea of abolition then is a significant and important challenge to the world as we have come to know it, to experience it, and to how we imagine it going forward. Abolition refuses the inevitability of our present organization of human life. The Haitian Revolution offers up one of the most compelling historical examples of the refutation of human enslavement. In his The Black Jacobins, Toussaint Louverture and the San Saint Domingo Revolution, the revered Caribbean intellectual C.L.R. James powerfully describes the profound Im imagining of racial subordination and conditions that the Haitian Revolution which began in 1791 and culminated in 1804, offered enslaved Africans. James argues persuasively that the enslaved wanted to be free and shows us how they effectively organized to achieve their freedom, all while demonstrating how a series of revolts culminating in the making of the colony, in the taking of the colony, I apologize, fully by the slaves, followed by the the Declaration of Independence in 1804. And I quote from James, the slaves had revolted because they wanted to be free, but no ruling class ever admits such things, James writes, pointing to critics of the revolution who did not want to acknowledge that the slave could have an idea of freedom for which they were willing to die. Taking one's freedom is a tremendous act of abolition. And while the term abolition is not often used in reference to revolution, because the latter term seems to our ears more radical, abolition is nevertheless a revolutionary idea and practice, since it demands a much deeper and newer commitment to all that it seeks to replace. Calls for the abolition of police in 2020, then operate with a similar dynamic and logic one in which establishment leaders like former US President Barack Obama and President-elect Joe Biden or Toronto's Mayor John Tory refuse to believe that the people demanding abolition actually want it or understand what they're organizing for. While for activists, abolition is a bold demand for a different kind of freedom or communities commitment to abolition continues to be minimized as irrational or uninformed, while elites of all stripes continue to undermine abolitionist movements. In the moment of George Floyd's death and the accompanying call for the abolition of the police, the ruling classes, state actors, and their interests, along with some intellectual elites, made the claim that those calling for abolition lacked a proper understanding of how policing works. They dismiss as emotional, irrational, and poorly taught through activist demands to defund the police and the criminal justice system, which in this essay I refer to as the criminal punishment system, and to eventually abolish those institutions that orient and govern our lives. So that's the first section. And what I try to do there really is to demonstrate um, a link between Black uprisings um, in the 18th century in particular um, and their ties to um, the contemporary moment, the abolition is unfinished business. Okay, but abolition is also very much tied to freedom and it's tied to the body and it's tied to how we're able to own our bodies. Or take the example of sagging pants, which involves the same problems of capital. Black body autonomy and the ways in which both the state and individuals intervene in numerous ways to circumvent small acts of black freedom or even the assertion of its possibility. Sagging pants were popularized as a style in the 1990s by skaters and hip hop artists. And though the style's origins aren't entirely clear, it seems to have first become a trend in the prison system 
either because prisoners were often given poorly fitting, fitting clothes and no belt, or because they used it as a sign of nonconformity, or both. Late in the 90s, Black youth began wearing sagging pants as a symbol of freedom and the rejection of values of mainstream society. Ordinances banned in sagging pants were passed in cities like Ocala, Florida, Treeport, Louisiana, later repeal, Picksville, Tennessee, and Wildwood, New Jersey, among other places, and stand as examples of how official bodies attempt to curtail Black bodily autonomy and freedom. Black men sagging their pants may be an attempt to attain some measure of control over their bodies, but it is nevertheless a refusal of white norms of comportment and thus must be interdicted and punished. Black people are not supposed to own their bodies. When black people like Obama speak out against sagging pants and other forms of youthful black style, what bothers them is that it references a much deeper refusal. Whereas I contend that it is part of an ethic that attempts to keep alive forms of black resistance that animate black life beyond capital. Policing as a practice is not only at the nexus of black and white antagonisms, it is central to antagonisms within and across black communities too. The logic of policing as its modern manifestation means that even in black countries, Policing operates with similar assumptions, though often cross-cut with class antagonisms. As such, it produces similar brutalities. In majority Black countries in the Americas, race and class often work to produce enclaves of whiteness in phenotype and in practice that enable forms of policing that mark working class Black people as available to harsh policing methods and practices. In October 2020, a Nigerian movement called NSARS, calling for the end to the special anti-robbery squad, better known as SARS, which has been accused of extrajudicial killings, theft and abuse, gained international attention for its resistance to police brutality in what is largely a black country. It's perhaps worth mentioning that SARS members were largely trained by British authorities. In Toronto, Tavis, or the Toronto Anti-Violence Intervention Strategy, has operated in a similar fashion, focusing on what we euphemistically call priority neighborhoods, meaning mostly the poor, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and poor white people. And that's just to give you a sense of the scope of some of the um, questions and concerns that I try to raise in this work. And then I'm gonna read from the, the conclusion of the book and then we can open it up to questions and conversations. Okay. We live in a moment where the value of black human life remains an ongoing question for many who are not black. Hashtags like black boy joy and black girl magic draw from the whimsy and the fantastic joy of black life to make a public case for living our lives and for living them large. But these hashtags also bring with them a certain suspension of critical judgment coalescing as a collective nod toward Black celebration that quickly moves from the banal, if sometimes surprising, to an easy and unquestioning acceptance of Black people's on critical participation in capital. Here I think of all of the Twitter stories of Black child entrepreneurs, bakers, designers, etc. Child labor celebrated. Indeed, what often gets celebrated on the hashtags such as, such as these, access to the crumbs of capital, is anything but magic and joy. Celebrating our participation in capital's margins does not seem to me to be a celebration of Black life. Rather, it marks a kind of perverse self-hatred, 
one of which capital still devours blackness. But these are the compromises we sometimes need to make. Abolition as a philosophic and actual practice moves beyond such compromises towards a different kind of settlement. Hashtags like Black Lives Matter and Say Her Name mark something different for me because they require us to face up to something more profound about our present and past, that we consider the desires, fears, pleasures, joys, wants, and needs, among a range of other things of, of Black people everywhere. They force the ongoing question of how Black lives might be valued in the midst of ongoing capitalism and its historically profound anti-Black racist formation, as I have only partially outlined here. There are those for whom such hashtags might invoke ideas of capital and restitution, but any real reckoning with Black people's subjection will return to the scene of the original crime bodily theft, land theft, genocide and near genocide, primitive accumulation, capitalism, and so on. And one must then eventually turn, if one is honest, to abolition as a politics too. But these hashtags also turn our attention to the genres of the human, woman, man, boy, girl, trans, persons with disabilities, and on and on, requiring us to think of them again and differently. Once more, it boils down to what kind of economy we want and the necessity for a new ethic of care. As we rethink and reorganize our lives, it will become even clearer what must be abolished to make way for a new, better and freer kind of existence. I have worn dreadlocks since I was about 20 years of age. More, or, let me begin that again. I have worn dreadlocks since I was about 20 years of age or most of my adult life. My locks are both an identification with Rastafarianism as well as a refusal to fully give in to your American norms of representation. Sorry your American norms of presentation and comportment. In short, my lock says something about my attempt to own myself. As a black gay man, I do not identify with some aspects of Rastafarianism, such as its patriarchal and homophobic inclinations. But I nevertheless still find its fire and brimstone declarations against white supremacy and capitalism deeply persuasive. What remains central for me about Rastafarianism is its communal philosophy and anti-capitalist stance. These alongside ideas expounded by radical black feminism have been the means through which I have come to understand that a different and indeed a better world is possible. The women of color who founded Insight have taught us for over two decades that violence cannot be the answer to violence. Furthermore, they have challenged us to profoundly rethink what we mean by care and how we might practice it. Their perspectives have oriented my thinking and behavior in profound ways and influenced my understanding of what abolition can mean. If we are to have any chance of transforming the way we live, we need to listen to them. More than that, we need to join them in their attempt to build a world we so desperately need. James Bowman was no Rastafarian, but he got at the heart of the matter as much as any one of his time. One day, perhaps, he wrote in 1964 in his essay, Nothing Personal, he continues, unimaginable generations hence, we will evolve into the knowledge that human beings are more important than real estate and will permit this knowledge to become the ruling principle of our lives. For I do not for an instant doubt 
and I will go to my grave believing that we can build Jerusalem if we will, end quote. Abolition, I strongly believe, is the means of this rebuilding. Ruth Wilson Gilmore has argued that abolition is not about, as so many have claimed, taking anything away. Rather, it is concerned with the presence of being, of fully being. The self needs to be present to others beyond itself. Or to put it another way, as Saidia Hartman has asked, is, is abolition a synonym for love? I respond with absolute certainty, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for those readings, Ronaldo. Um, so did you want to open it up uh, to audience questions now? Yes. Um, yeah, I think um, we can open up to audience questions. I think what I'll say is that, you know, this is a, a short book and it's meant to intervene into the conversation that arose after the murder of the spectacular murder of George Floyd, where people took to the streets asking for the defunding of the police, for the abolition of prisons. And this book tries to explain in part where those demands came from, mm -hmm. that those demands had been long a part of Black and other activist communities, um, feminists of color communities like Insight, um, who had long organized to think differently um, and to think about different remedies for violence in their communities that might not involve the police. And, um, and so this book roams across um, the history of abolition from abolition of slave trade, the emergence of the police in slave, in slave societies, um, it looks at contemporary policing and, and, and the ways in which Black and Indigenous people in Canada in particular are, uh, are caught up in, in policing as a practice. It looks at the cost of policing and what, you know, it's the, something like the city of Toronto, how much they spend on their budget, the largest line item in their budget. Um, and it looks at what we mean by abolition when we say, um, abolish the police, abolish prisons. Um, what does that mean? And that means that we're really talking about an entire whole scale reorienting of our society and culture. And it's very sober in the assessment that it took us a long time to build what we have, and it will take us a long time to undo what we have and build something new. Mm -hmm. So it's not, this is not um, a proposal or an argument that we can flip the switch and have happen. Um, and so, yeah, um, in, the, in the book, what I didn't read in the book, I talk about drawing from indigenous, global indigenous cultures, that's not just North American, to rethink the commons, all of the world's resources, ideas, all of the world's heritage that we share in common, um, to think about that and to really um, share that in common so that we can rethink what planetary life looks like. And so those are some of the big ideas that are in the short book. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I, big ideas is an understatement. Um, I, I think it's, it's fascinating because I don't think there would be many people that would argue that there aren't problems within the system and yet there's such a resistance to challenge it in any way. Um, and I, I suppose for someone who is um, approaching that idea for the first time or considering it as a possibility for the first time, um, what advice would you give in terms of like what direction to go in one's research to learn more and to learn about some of the alternatives that are out there, some of the ideas that, that people are bringing up that are viable um, and and essential at this time? That's a great, great question. Um, in the first section that I read, I mentioned the name Mariam Kaba, 
and she has a book that came out about the same time as my book called We Do This Till We Free Us. Um, and it's she's a, a, a prison um, abolitionist and organizer, um, a founder of fantastic organizations, both in Chicago and New York a writer, thinker, and she's a great place to start. Um, she has ran a blog called the Prison Culture Blog for a really long time that is chock full of resources. Insight, Women of Color organization, um, another place that you can go to. Project Nia out of Chicago um, is another place. Um, right now there are different groups of people building similar kinds of knowledge infrastructures in the Canadian context. But the place to begin is to really do some significant personal reflection. One of the things that we learn about that we have come to understand about policing is, and I write a little bit about this in the book, is that policing is such a powerful structure that even though most of us might actually in our lifetime never have anything to do with policing, meaning that we don't have to call them because someone transgressed us, that we don't need police services if they have been removed. But we have so internalized policing as a part of what it means to be a modern person. Now, all of us at some point believe we need the police. All of us come to believe that the police is really important to how it is that we might experience the world that we live in. And one of the things about moving towards an abolitionist consciousness is to work that out of our system. And so the resources that I just named, Project NIA, um, inside feminist women of color organizing. You know, at the small scale in a number of communities, um, people are actually dealing with conflict and transgression on their own without the police. And um, you can find these resources online. Um, many of them are community generated resources often, not exclusively, but most often um, led and created by Black and women of color feminists and other allies. And people are dealing with everything from um, sexual assault, um, physical harm, um, child sexual abuse, really difficult stuff. And communities are finding ways to adjudicate these things to deal with the transgression of these practices without involving the police and, and, and criminal justice system or the, or the criminal punishment system as we like to call it. And part of that has to do with a really simple notion that communities actually know what's best for communities. And the overarching structure of policing and criminal punishment um, is actually a blunt force, it's a violent force. And communities know that, um, as I said in reading one about insight, that violence does not actually fix violence, that responding to violence with violence actually perpetuates violence. Um, so as Mariam Kaba would say that, um, police have had three to 400 years of practicing their craft. So we know, in some ways we know what to expect. And so people have internalized that deeply. People who, who hold another view of what is possible have not had the same time to do that, to practice their craft and to build the kinds of structures and societies to show that um, policing is not, policing as we presently know it is not um, worthwhile. Um, so yeah. And well, and I, I think too, um, there is this sense, um, people think of abolition as like, 
creating a vacuum or absolute anarchy, like get rid of it and then just let everything, you know, like everything run amok, but that's not the case. I mean, there are already like support systems in place for many of the things that the police also do. And exactly. they arguably do the, a much better, much more sensitive, much less violent job of it. Um, so um, I wonder if you could speak to, to that a little bit, just about, um, yeah, I, I guess assuaging the fears of like abolition equaling anarchism. Yeah, definitely. You know, one of the things that's really interesting, when I made a point about how we've internalized police and policing, so not just police as in the folks in the uniforms and the institution, but the very idea of what it does um, is a part of what makes us modern people. We've internalized it as, as a structure. And so when people hear you talk about abolishing the police, they, their first response and a legitimate response is, but what do we do when people are harmed? What do we do when someone takes your stuff, right? Because that's how, you know, for 300 years that's been beaten into us. And so one of the first things that abolitionists would tell you is that the idea of abolishing the police is not about taking away anything. It's not about taking away security. It's not about leaving you open to vulnerability. It's not about leaving you open to abuse of any sort. It's about all of us becoming much more present to each other in the world. So it shifts the dynamic from one of having to establish a kind of autonomous force that intervenes on our behalf when we feel we've been transgressed, when con conflict has occurred, to shifting the dynamic to one, as you would have heard me echo in, in my reading, to one of a different account of care. So if we're present to each other, then we begin to see when harm happens, when conflict arises, when transgression occurs. And that ethic of care then requires us to develop ways of dealing with transgression, conflict, and harm. So abolitionists are nowhere um, fancy fan fantasists in the sense that we think you get rid of the police and you get rid of harm, you get rid of violence. What we are is committed to a notion of caring for each other in ways that are far more profound and, deep, and far more meaningful than we currently do, than what we currently have. And that's why Ruth Wilson Gilmore um, says that abolition is the idea that we change everything. We don't just change the police and prisons, we change everything. And in this book on property, I talk about um, what it would mean to create an entirely different society. Um, a society that is not grounded in capitalist accumulation, but a society that is grounded in an ethic of care in which we are responsible for people who we might share nothing in common with. And that in and of itself um, propels us into a different ethical direction. Um, um, just a reminder um, that if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to, to join us in this conversation. Um, you can, oh, oh there we go. <laughs> um, so I have a question saying, do you think that there is a direct relation between a community size, their property capital and their willingness to imagine other ways of dealing with transgression other than by the police? I, I think that's a really good question. I, I think given current arrangements, it might appear to be that way, but of course there are other cultures still with us um, I invoke um, global indigenous cultures of all kinds, whether the African continent, Turtle Island, where we are, um, and so on, where the question of conflict and transgression um, was historically dealt with quite differently. 
than the kinds of structures of policing that we have that come out of the, the, the land theft of indigenous peoples and the enslavement of African peoples. So this kind of question of you know, size of community, um, communities are both macro and micro. So um, at a macro level, the scale of how one deals with transgression um, would be different. Of course, you know, in all the indigenous cultures that I invoke, you know, they went to war with other cultures and so on and so forth. So again, abolition is not into romance, but they also made treaties with other cultures. They also um, made compacts with other cultures. They built civilizations, they adjudicated forms of life, both at the macro level and the micro level. And we have lost these things. We have lost our ability um, to be able to create the kinds of communities where we actually know our neighbors, where um, we know um, what resources are available to each other, um, and where then when conflict and harm happens that we can address it at the micro level. So it's not a question of, um, of size of communities, it's a question of organizing principles of how we understand what life should be and could be. Um, I, I know we're talking about this book, but I'm interested too in, in the other book that you published this year. Um, the uh, the long emancipation and um, does that tie into to some of the conversation that that you have in on property? Yes, actually, the two books are more closely related than I thought. So yeah, so the long emancipation is my academic book, and it really looks at the question, but it's very much influenced. Um, and I, I began writing it in 2014, 2015 as the movement for Black Lives, BLM movement um, took off. It's very much trying to think about why the scale of violence enacted on Black people in North America um, might have something to do with the tremendous amount of loss of life of Africans crossing um, the Mediterranean to reach Europe and kind of trying to think what is the relationship between those two things. And um, it really sent me back to the historical archive to think about what exactly is freedom. And part of what I argue in that book is that emancipation is a juridical and legislative practice. So whether we're talking about the former slave colonies of the Caribbean or slavery in North America, what Black people were offered was emancipation, not freedom. And that part of the reason why we see the kinds of violences and brutalities is that we are still in what I call the time of emancipation. But I argue that that's the similar case for the African continent as well. That what you would call the colonial and post-colonial period are really, um, it's really a logic of emancipation. And, and part of the reason that um, the nation states function as they are is because they are trapped by the legislative and juridical functions of emancipation. Um, therefore, in part, leading to the push factors of, of people leaving. But I also very much like in on property, um, in the long emancipation, I also point to the way in which you can see moments of freedom practiced by black people. There's a section in the book, which is a kind of meditation on funk, funk as music, funk as movement, funk as smell, <laughs> funk as, you know, and funk as freedom, right? Um, and so part of what I'm, I'm trying to do across these two works is to kind of try to begin to offer a different account 
of what the world we live in is and what it might be. And, um, and, and to be not too sanguine about um, pushing against, taking for granted historical frames that have been handed to us, um, but to be able to push back against them and, and to write from my own place of being a black queer person in the world who, you know, does not always see things the way um, many others would. And to, to offer that a legitimate place in the public sphere, to offer that out as a legitimate place in the public sphere. Um, do you think that the potential for change is different in somewhere like Canada versus in the United States? I'm not sure. I think that, you know, um, both places are hampered by the same kinds of histories of their foundation. One might be a bit more violent than the other, but, you know, I mean, one of the striking things about, you know, the, the, the correspondences between Canada and the US. In the US, you know, um, while people don't, might not actually realize this, more indigenous people are murdered by the police than black people. Um, but nonetheless, black and indigenous people are the ones who are most subjected to extrajudicial killings by the police. Um, they're the ones who populate um, the prison communities. And that is exactly the same case in Canada, right? Um, these are the places where you begin to see um, a certain kind of unity of our colonial histories and founding. Um, that the, the persons, the collective persons of Black and Indigenous that are also the collective persons that made the colonial project possible in a certain kind of way are also the persons that are experiencing the most duress in the contemporary moment. And that doesn't just manifest itself in policing and prisons, it manifests itself in housing, in healthcare, in education, and on and on. So the thing about Canada and the US is that the manifestations of the forms of violence um, take on a different kind of tenor. And, and I would never, I, I'm, I'm not one to talk about can Canadian racism as being subtle because people experiencing racism don't experience it as subtle. Um, but I do think that there's something about the nature of the parliamentary state <laughs> um, that um, produces the effects of colonial violence differently. Um, and of course, Canada reinvented itself as a multicultural nation state, um, making the way in which we might talk about the ongoing manifestations of those colonial violences even a little bit more complicated and complex. But you know, one of the stats that I that I quote from you know CBC um, um, did a, a study of seventeen years of policing, national policing stats on arrests, killings of Black and Indigenous people, of police, policeness of force, and you know Black and Indigenous people were at the top of the list. And um, in 2020, um, the last year of those stats, again, Black and Indigenous people were at the top of the list. In Ontario, the Ontario Human Rights um, Commission did a study on policing and found that, you know, a Black man, a Black person in Toronto is 20 times more likely to be shot by the police than any other group. So these are really kind of sobering um, evidence 
uh, what on the rights or society. You know, for some of us to feel safe, then there's a logic that some other people have to be taken care of, have to be um, policed in really stringent fashion. And that's, and that's shared across the borders. Um, well, when you talked about uh, like freedom versus emancipation, and I, I think of, um, you know, the, the conversation with Indigenous peoples of land back versus reconciliation. And, you know, exactly. Yeah, like reconciliation yeah. and emancipation sound like lovely things, but they, they're not, they don't involve the same amount of responsibility and action. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the same distribution of power, mm -hmm. of power and authority to craft directions of where we should go collectively. And that in a, that's one of the things that I argue in the other book, The Long Emancipation, that part of what happened is that um, if emancipation is juridical and legislative, freedom is something else. And every time um, Black or Indigenous people try to craft what freedom might mean for them, it's interdicted with violence. Um, whether it's you know the RCMP um, removing indigenous land protectors uh, so that mining companies and logging companies can carry out their capitalist extractive um, projects, um, the example that I gave you know of the ordinances of how black men might wear their clothes, right? So just the attempt to own your body can again become criminalized with a $1,500 um, fine for the underwear sticking out the top of your pants. Um, so these are, they might seem simple, but these are the ways in which on freedom replicates itself. These are the ways in which one is told, you are actually not free. Uh, and they might, people who experience it may not articulate it the way that I just did, but that's definitely um, the underlying narrative that's being sent. Yeah, well, when there are restrictions on how you live, act, and present yourself, then yeah, is that exactly? Yeah. And who gets to decide what what is proper comportment, mm -hmm. right? So that takes away a certain kind of autonomy from you. Mm -hmm. um, we only have uh, a few more minutes left. So um, again, if anyone has uh, any questions they would like to ask, and if not, I wonder, Ronaldo, if you have any uh, final words or, or comments that you'd, you'd like to, to leave us with. You know, I think what I would like to leave you with is the sense that you know, um, this stuff might seem big. It might seem daunting. It might seem like impossible. But the truth of the matter is that the world that we live in is one that we made. Like we made this world. We actively constructed it we decided what would be valued. We decided what would be given priority. We decided what would be celebrated. And we can reorder all of that. And part of, you know, there's a moment in this book where I write that, in fact, if we are to save this planet um, and therefore, save human life and all of planetary life, we are actually going to have to reckon with an entirely different account of what it is we value, of what we think is our priorities, of what we think um, should be celebrated. Because we can see that what we have done so far is destroying us and the planet. So, um, we are definitely in for a collective reckoning.
I, I want to thank you so much for uh, sharing your your thoughts in, the, in this time with us today. Um, uh, also, just a reminder that we did have a book draw. So, uh, Grace Law, congratulations to you. You are a winner of a copy of On Property. Um, and for those of you who didn't win a copy but would like to purchase one, um, a reminder to visit our official bookseller novel idea copies that are available there now in store by phone or online and if you're joining us from outside of uh, the Kingston region please consider supporting um, our, all of our authors at the local independent bookstore of your choice um, so I want to thank you again uh, to to Ronaldo and to our audience for joining us this is the final event of Kingston Writers Fest 2021 um, the virtual edition and uh, hopefully <laughs> we will be in person again next year. For everyone else, thank you so much for joining us today.